Yep. <laughs> what? Welcome to the Spirit of Independence. On today's episode, we're going to look at the work of Toby and Fionn Watts, collectively known as Far North Film. Their diverse range of films has covered such genres as animation, documentary and fiction. Far North Films are a real dilemma. Some, some of the first work that I saw that Far North Film produced uh, was Marriage of Convenience, which I understand you, you did when you were at university. Now, it was a, a comedy film, which I always think is quite a notoriously difficult genre to get right. So what made you choose to do that as an early as an early film? Well, that's quite a funny one, actually, because um, my original I idea was to do like a psychological thriller about a very angsty actor who didn't really know who he was. And the group I was put with thought that was too complicated to do. So one guy in it who'd done some comedy films before said, can we do my idea? <laughs> so I lost that battle uh, and ended up just being the director of photography on the film instead. Um, and at the time I hated it. I didn't enjoy making it one bit, but it won the best student film that year. And I felt quite good at afterwards, found it quite funny and amusing to do it. So. Do you, do you find comedy uh, is quite a good thing to cut your teeth on almost taking a difficult genre and, and tackling it rather than going with something that's perhaps a bit safer? I think so. I think we, you know, being kind of experimental with comedy ideas can be a lot of fun. And you can just kind of go out with a camera and create a character, make things up as you go along and see how it works. It doesn't matter if it's not funny, but you just experiment and eventually find that people are laughing or at least you're having fun doing it. So I, I think comedy can be, you know, a really good fun part of filmmaking and almost a relief for some of the more intense kind of stuff that you end up doing more straight up dramas or horrors or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find, because I know it's Stirling University, Stirling that, University that you yeah. studied at and... Um, Toby, you studied at Cambridge yeah. in science. Yes, so. yeah. um, did you? How, what, what did you find of the university experience? What did it kind of teach you about film? Um, I think I think one of the things because I found my student film particularly d difficult to make because we got pushed into a team of people, and I found that quite stressful because in the real world you you normally get to sort of choose and make relationships and work with people you already get on with. So I think I learned about the importance of good relationships and working as part of a team. And the filmmaking outside of university and the film society was always a lot of fun because you get together with your mates and you're really creatively free. But working in the structure of filmmaking the university set was actually not not so much fun <laughs> and quite uh, quite stressful. Yeah, and uh, I think that that's that's a difficult thing when you're yeah. at university because, like you said, you're not necessarily with a, a group of like-minded people. Yeah. Um, did you then find that you, you actually learnt more about filmmaking when you finished university and you were doing it on the job then? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think at university I was incredibly deluded, really, about what was going to happen. I, I thought I want to be a film director and I'm probably going to go straight to Hollywood and the world's going to see all my great ideas. And the truth is you actually join the back of the queue of the job centre <laughs> and yeah. you're thinking, OK, how do I actually make this work? How do I earn money from that? So I think going through all that, you know, is a, is a really important process because it brings you to reality and you start thinking okay I need to drop my ego and start from scratch and really start to learn about about filmmaking and what it takes to succeed in this industry. And I think that was helpful for me as well having seen Fionn go out solo and do some freelance work before I graduated from Cambridge um, it helped me to realise what the reality actually looked like um, so that I wasn't going to go out and be the next greatest <laughs> thing you know but I could see that it was just yeah. there him and his iMac trying to get work yes. and uh, it gave me a sense of perspective, so I knew I had to just go home basically and uh, start trying to pick up work, living cheaply. So your uh, your wife just left you. Yep, that's one for you. What was that? The neighbours. It sounded like it was coming from your hallway. I'll be okay for you, boy. What's your game, Clive? Game? Uh, he That Dances, which I, I thought was a really interesting idea and I loved the, the, the idea of doing animation and telling this story. It's very much set in Yorkshire. Uh, where, where did that idea come from? Well, um, I came across this competition called Enter the Pitch, which challenges filmmakers to look at different stories in the Bible and to dramatise them really and come up with a two minute film pitch. So there was a story in the Bible that always intrigued me uh, about these two men on the road to Emmaus and 
they actually encounter the resurrected Jesus and um, they have no idea who he is. They just don't recognize him, although they've spent all this time with him. So it's kind of a black comedy and Jesus plays along with this thing, asking them questions about what's been happening lately and so on. So I thought it'd be fun to come up with these two characters who are obsessed with somebody, somebody who's very important in their life and he happens to be a, a flamenco dancer that's been very famous in Yorkshire. Um, and the dad has had this failed career and put all his hopes on this man who disappeared, but of course reappears on the road to, to this competition. Um, and so it was really just trying to find a, a way into this Bible passage um, through, through a, a comedic lens, really, and uh, bring that to the screen. What, what made you choose to do it as an animation? Um, I think basically I just thought, I'm not sure how I can afford the time or the resources to go out and actually film a load of stuff with, you know, with actors. So I thought about just doing voiceovers and um, I'd come across this, uh, this artist um, through some networking meetings and he'd done some great uh, pictures that I thought actually that would suit the style really well, really expressive stuff. So we just got chatting and basically he did some sketches for me and we went from there. And what was your experience of actually entering the competition? And, and I guess part of what this series is about is giving young filmmakers the basis to understand about what they need to do. So what's, how did you find the experience or what advice would you give to young filmmakers? Um, I think it's very important to you know, use all your imagination and try and do something as different as possible, of course. Um, and yeah, just not to worry and try and don't get too hung up on looking at what people have done in the past at the competition and what works, um, because what worked one year might not be what the judges are looking for next year. But at the same time, it's important to look at what the exact criteria is for the competition and to study what overall what the judges are looking for. Um, but really just to let your imagination go and be free, because no one's paying you to do it. You might as well enjoy doing it. So if you don't win, um, you want to be able to come and s away and say, I actually got a lot from that. Yeah, and I guess the, the, the way that he, the dancers, was put together with a, a flamenco dancer and this Yorkshireman obsessed with it, it's quite a sort of left field idea. Mm. Is, is that something that you think is important to really kind of like so get, let your imagination run? I think so. I think for me, you know, it's, it's always a nice challenge to come in at a tangent to things and give people something they've not seen before. At the same time, you do risk uh, baffling or bewildering judges uh, if they haven't got quite that sense of humour or that way of looking at life. You do run the risk of them just thinking, well, this, this isn't going to work. I can't see yeah. how the vision is going to come together, which possibly is what happened with He That Dances. I don't know. Um, but for me, it was a satisfying piece of work because I know in my head I can see it strongly and I'm glad that's the way it came together. Now Bailey, I know we're in Scotland but you've got to start somewhere and by gum lad with my help one day you'll be the greatest flamenco dancer in Yorkshire. But I want to be a mechanic. Good gracious lad, next you'll be wanting to go down pits with your mother and sisters. No, you'll dance, just like your old man used to. Selkie's Lover, which I really like the piece, just thought it was a really beautiful story, kind of rooted in fairy tale. Yeah. Um, and as I said, you kind of co-produced that, that side of things. How did you get involved in that project? Well, we were living in the north of Scotland at the time and there wasn't a lot happening in terms of film up there by John O'Groats. And there's a local website where a filmmaker had moved up and he was saying, is there any other filmmakers out there who'd like to you know, work on a project? And I said to Toby, oh, we should go meet this guy. Yeah. And Toby said, uh, I don't know, he's probably completely deluded, I'd stay away from it. And I said, well, there's no harm in this, go meet him in the pub and see how it goes. So we met this guy, Michael Groom, and um, actually he was a great guy. We thought, you know, he's not deluded, he knows what he's doing, he's got a really great idea, he's got a good track record. So we started working, well, he, he went and wrote the script, and um, we started working with him towards producing it and um, help him, helping him make that happen. Um, I always like the idea of bringing kind of fairy tale ideas in, into the modern yeah, day. Yeah. W was that the, the idea of the Selkie? I take it that that's a sort of well known um, story in, the, in yeah. Scotland? It's kind of like the sort of mythic kind of Scottish mermaid story. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, there was a graveyard, uh, graveyard locally where there was actually a, a silk, unmarked silky grave apparently in this story. That went went along with it. So I think Michael was very interested in that, being interested in sort of romantic literature and history. Mm. So it all came from Michael really, and we liked the idea of it. We thought we'd never done anything like that before. That'd be a lot of fun to be involved with. Yeah, yeah. it's actually something I've, I've sort of never heard of that idea before. Yeah. But, it, but it's you can kind of see where it's come from sure. and developed this idea about about mermaid. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that what it reminded me a, a lot of for some reason is local hero. Yeah. And that, I, I, you know, it may just yeah. be a thing of connected with Scotland. Yes. But I think it's the idea about using the outdoors a lot as well. Yes. Mm. So it, it, it's, were you very conscious about using kind of the Scottish landscape when you were filming? Definitely. I think that was a, a big so. consideration. And the, the early drafts of the script that Michael produced had a lot of different locations and scenes just to get these places on camera because when you're working on a low budget, you've got to use what assets you've got. And the outdoors and the quality of the light and some of the great castles and landmarks you've got in the north of Scotland are incredible and just make your film look really expensive. Um, so we thought, let's just get as much of that as yeah. we can within the confines of a good story. Mm. Uh, so we did a lot of driving on the day, a lot of just visiting places, getting a few shots, and mm. hopefully it builds a sense of the, the history and the atmosphere of the area. And you had two strong actors in there as well. Yeah, yeah. How, how did you find find your actors for it? I think Michael had looked, uh, was, it, was it Lambda or somewhere? Uh, one of the big drama schools yeah. down in London. I think he, he'd gone, he'd looked at quite a few different people and he needed, it was very important to find exactly the right person, female, for the, to play the Silky because she had to be both kind of mystical and beautiful but also kind of innocent and mm. be a bit naive, you know. So, so that, you know, it, Michael really took a lot of time overthinking about who would play the right actors, and I think he made a great choice, actually. I think they were brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously using two actors is, I, I always find, personally, a lot easier because you're dealing with, with, a, with a sort of smaller, mm. uh, smaller cast as well. Yes. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that certainly helped the, the sort of intimacy of the piece. Yes, that's yeah, right. Because yes. they're actually the only two actors that appear in the film. You don't actually see any other human beings. So there is a sense of isolation and loneliness, which works well for the, the male lead character in the film. Sometimes we don't feel like we fit in certain situations as humans but just a different way of thinking or thinking uh, differently about a situation and suddenly things make sense. So the process is really um, consistent with my experience as a human. The documentaries uh, that you did, uh, the Echo documentary, is all about the, the st structure, the building of the, this sort of art piece of art in, in Scotland, quite an unusual uh, piece. Whereabouts did that come from? Well, um, this was at a time when I'd just graduated from university and I was living back at home with my dad in the north of Scotland. Um, and so I was looking for work and I heard that there was going to be this artist coming from America to build this installation. Um, so I got in touch with him and said, would you like me to make a documentary record of what you're doing? And he said, yeah, OK, that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll get you a little bit of money and, mm. uh, and you can do that. So it was really fun. Just for a few weeks, I sat up with my camera and a microphone and uh, just started filming. And I had no idea, really, what I was doing. I'd watched one or two documentaries that were relevant, similar kind of style and themes, um, and just went out and, and did it, really, and asked him loads of questions, filmed hours and hours of footage, and then basically slapped it in front of you, didn't I? And mm -hmm. said, right, <laughs> you need to cut me a film now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I think so, some of what the... Um the, the, the guy who's building the piece, I think some of the lines that he comes up with, mm. well, a, a, a really sort of philosophical, mm. sort of art-induced lines mm. that, that I found really gave it, gave it an extra edge. Mm -hmm. Was all that sort of stuff natural? Did he say it naturally? It was actually, yeah. It's, when I set out to make it, I, I thought in order to capture the essence of the piece, the film itself has to be quite poetic and a, as much a piece of art as it can so that it will it will echo uh, what he's doing mm. um, and so I tried to draw out some of the more philosophical um, instincts that he had and <coughs> things he was drawing on um, and he was actually very good at that being an academic uh, and a lecturer at a university he had a lot of interesting thoughts about his process a lot of which I didn't actually understand and I had to go away and study that <laughs> um, but I think just to layer those through the audio throughout the film helps mm. to give it a sense of mystery that it needed. <laughs> yeah, and it, it also personalises it to, you know, to, to, to the subject as well. It makes it his and, and it almost, you know, you made the film, but it, but, but it felt like his, his sort of documenting yeah. what he was doing as well. When does anything good ever happen? I can't believe that, you know, all I wanted was a few beers for tonight and I can't even have that. 
Well, I'll give you the money for that. Yeah, but we can't afford it, can we? That's what's so stupid, we needed that scratch card. I swear, sometimes I just feel like life is against me. Uh, dilemmas, which, which I thought was a really interesting piece, where, where you've got the people setting sort of moral and ethical dilemmas and, and, and how they handle it. Uh, really interested to know where, where that came from. Um, it's quite a long and convoluted history with that, really, that we wanted to create a project um, that was all about delivering short films via an app, just when the sort of the app revolution was happening five years ago or so. So we thought, why not do a sort of thought for the day type films that give people something to think about? Um, so we went and made a pilot just for, for no money up in Wick in the far north of Scotland, showed it to a load of people mm. and got some feedback. And it slowly evolved into mm. uh, this kind of moral dilemma uh, idea. Mm. Yeah, and I know you, you did a bit of acting in there as well. Is that something that you're quite interested in? Yeah, I think I've always had uh, had that in me. I've always loved getting in front of the camera when I can. Um, I don't do so much of it these days, um, but any opportunity when someone says we come and stand in or we come and act in this, I'm always keen to mm. to get involved. Yeah. Yeah, and I, for for me, kind of keeping stories short, snappy, I think is a good way to hone your craft as mm. well. Did you find that sort of an easy thing to do or did you find I want to draw this out more and sort of make it a longer piece? I think we had a lot of discussions, didn't we, about what you could do in a couple of minutes, whether you could actually move somebody emotionally or whether you just give them a message. I mean, obviously adverts work and they're only 30 seconds. Mm. So we really analysed everything thoroughly, didn't we, before we went into the process mm. of making these films. But I think ultimately we wanted pe to stimulate people's own thinking. What do you think? What do you think should happen? Rather than telling anybody what to think, which isn't never a great idea with filmmaking, really. Mm. Yeah, because I was quite curious about what, what your overall aim was for, yeah. for, for the Dilemma series, and I presume was it to kind of invoke that emotional reaction to get people thinking about these sorts of situations? I think so. I think that was the idea, really, was to just stimulate a lot of discussion and something that could be used by various kind of groups, mm, you know, mm. philosophical, religious groups or whoever, yeah. um, to make people think a little bit more, rather than just acting and doing stuff, but mm. to stop and to say, hmm, actually, there's a choice here. Mm. Yeah. You know, which, is, which is best. Yeah, uh, well, we weren't overly concerned about yeah. whether we were giving the exact, you know, sort of correct or most accurate representation of what might happen in a real-world situation because sometimes people react more strongly and have more things to say about a piece if they think that's totally wrong, like, it wouldn't go like that. So um, it, that was quite freeing as well, just to see that whatever you do is going to provoke some kind of reaction, which is helpful for discussion. Good. Um, and like I said, the, the, the series is centred around helping young filmmakers get an idea as, as to what they can do. What sort of advice would you give young filmmakers out there? I think... Um, you know, we, we get emails from mm. people all the time just asking us, you know, if they can get involved with us and so on. And we always say to them, well, can you send us any links to anything you've done or anything you're planning to do? Because um, if people are a little bit vague about what areas they want to get involved with, um, sometimes it's quite hard to know how to help those people. But the more specific you can be about what you're going after, mm. and if you've worked on anything at all, whether it's something at high school or mm. as a student, that's helpful to help place you in uh, other people's minds who yes. can maybe give you a leg up in the industry. To know exactly what you want to do really helps. If somebody writes to you and says, I want to be a producer, I want to be a director, I want to do camera, that helps a lot more than people saying, I'll do anything, because then you don't quite know what to do with them. You know? mm. But I think also to watch a lot of films, mm. not, not, to not be afraid of reading books as well, and learning, mm. learn about screenwriting, learn about storytelling. It's not all about technical stuff, you know, have something to say, um, go through things, mature, and then find out what you want to say, and, and just get as much experience as possible, get involved.